I would like to hear your stance on benzos while on MAT. If the patient truly needs the benzos due to anxiety or seizure or some other reason? This is a wonderful question. Uh, let's answer the question what they mean by MAT first uh, because I'm going to group this into if they're talking about methadone versus buprenorphine. In terms of methadone, let me answer that first and be brief on that and move to buprenorphine. <clears throat> All of the issues that are discussed regarding benzodiazepines and opiates as a classes that are have very negative adverse effects if you mix them, they truly apply to methadone because it is a full agonist and you can get a substantial high in euphoria by mixing benzodiazepines and methadone. In fact, uh, as early as the 70s in New Jersey and New York, addicts were picking up their medications from the methadone clinic and then moving on and picking up their benzodiazepines. And we just discussed that on an earlier question regarding switching from methadone to suboxone. So that's all I'll say about that and move on to the buprenorphine products. This question is interesting because there is quite a big bit of stigma within my professional community of mixing suboxone or buprenorphine with benzodiazepines. In fact, I have one patient that I only manage her benzodiazepine long-term taper and she's at a methadone clinic and we've built a rapport where I can go ahead and manage it and she can stay on benzodiazepines even though we're talking about buprenorphine now, but there's so much stigma with it. The issue with benzodiazepines and uh, and uh, opiates in general are that they have an additive effect, <clears throat> both in terms of the euphoria and or getting high, but it increases your risks of bad things happening to you. The worst thing being respiratory depression and you stop breathing. And the data is pretty uh, clear uh, in the bulk effect of this issue, and that's if you have both of them in your system, you're more likely to stop breathing. And that makes sense. There is some data that shows the same thing with buprenorphine products, but I think it's misunderstood. And if you take a person that's regularly on buprenorphine and you add a little bit of benzos, uh, I can assure you their respiratory rate doesn't decrease nor are they at a risk of overdosing. Again, this has to do with the practitioner and understanding the data and being comfortable with that. So I'm certainly not telling you to go out there and ask your doctor, hey, uh, I'm on Suboxone and this doctor says I can have some benzos. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if it's managed under a right practitioner and he's comfortable with that, the data certainly does not say if you are on two milligrams of clonopin and 16 milligrams of buprenorphine, you have a higher risk of respiratory depression and death. So that's what the clinical data that's out there boils down to is understanding that data and keeping the patient under close observation. Now comes the question, why do so many patients on medication-assisted treatment need that kind of care? And uh, that's a, almost a more interesting question for me is that uh, this population of patients suffers from a lot of anxiety. And uh, the anxiety goes during their substance abuse, long before their substance abuse, and sometimes, or rather oftentimes, this is the first time they are clean. And yes, they are clean being on Suboxone. And there is a new added anxiety to that. And they have to deal with things in that way. I certainly never, ever start or suggest a benzodiazepine class of medications for a patient that's on Suboxone. But they're, they're coming with a long history of use, abuse, dependence, or diagnosed anxiety, I will not stop that medication. What I will do is create, so because A, I'm not worried about overdose if done right. Once I get over that issue, now I look at the patient and you know, Joe is sitting in front of me and he's a patient and we take a look and he wants Xanax. 
First thing I do is decrease the liability to his body and abuse potential, and I highly suggest switching over to something like clonopin. At that point, I take a look at the dose they're on, okay? If it's a reasonable dose, okay, I stop there, and if it's not, I wanna get it to a reasonable dose. After that, if you're a new patient, I simply wanna build trust. And for the first few weeks, you have to come in weekly for your medication and uh, follow-up and uh, potentially urine testing. So overall, uh, in answering this question, I would say a lot of people that suffer from substance abuse have severe anxiety that's long-standing or new, and therefore, and sometimes, depending on what medications they have been on before, and meaning benzodiazepines, I continue that medication, try to adjust it, make it a low and reasonable dose, and eventually, especially if they're young, I start to work on a long-term taper. I have many patients like this, and many of them are getting off their benzos one after other, and they feel extremely empowered by that. One final caveat on this issue is that I try to steer away from Xanax because it has a high abuse potential and uh, has a high euphoria potential. Let's just say that. Even with something like Xanax, there you have to remember every body is different, every physiology is different, the reaction to medications is different. There are a few patients that I have on Xanax, low dose, closely monitored. In fact, one of those patients is a methadone patient and we meet every week to monitor and evaluate their Xanax. So there's no cookie cutting here. Uh, every patient is different. And I give it to you with uh, a lot of, uh, uh, not hesitation, but uh, uh, sort of a underwriting here that yes, in the right circumstances, understanding the clinical literature, understanding the patient and their needs, using benzodiazepines and buprenorphine, MAT type products is absolutely okay. And in my practice, there's dozens of patients that have really been maintained on that and even tapered off. The next question I would like to answer uh, is, um, <clears throat> the patient asked, the viewer asked, uh, would you discuss your most difficult patients, and they put in parentheses, diversion, lying, still using, et cetera. I interpret the first part of that question in two ways. When they say difficult, first I look at the medical clinical part and I have many of those interesting patients, especially my pain patients and how they reacted to the medications. But I think the viewer in this case is asking uh, about uh, behavioral difficulty. That really for me is a translation into the manifestation of the disease. In specific, they ask diversion, lying, still using. I think this is a great question, and this might be more edifying for the practitioners out there versus the viewers, because you have all run into this issue with physicians. From my position and the way I look at this, if some of you have gone to my website or are familiar with my practice, I look at this as a chronic disease and I apply the concepts of harm reduction. The concept of harm reduction, most people think of it as handing out Narcan or needle exchange. But if you go uh, sort of look at this from the 30,000 foot view, harm reduction is nothing more than a universal set of principles that respect the autonomy of the human being, in this case, a patient. And you work with them, to put it in short. So when I have patients that come into me and there might be lying or continued use, and even at times diversion, uh, I break those up into different ways. You have to have certain assumptions and lack of judgment. There is no judgment in what you do. And the assumption is, unless if I see otherwise, all of your behavior is part of your disease and a manifestation of your disease. So if you come to me lying, there's data out there that tells me that there's changes in parts of your brain that really, really, really sort of stereotype the mechanism that occurs pathophysiologically for you to lie. 
and this can be explained in terms of an evolutionary construct and how substance abuse takes over your mind. But the point is, I simply take it as part of your disease, lying to me, still using. And here's what needs to be done. You can't be a police for the patients. You are not the judge, you are not law enforcement, and you are uh, uh, certainly not here to make any personal judgments on the patients. Your job is to do the best you can do for a marginalized population that not only does lie at times, not only do they cheat at times, not only do they use at times, but they've suffered all kinds of abuse. The first and most important thing to do is build a rapport so they feel absolutely comfortable and confident in being open with you. Once that happens, uh, the lying starts to dissipate or it gets minimized. I might ask, hey, did you use this week or today? And maybe they used every day and they'll say I used only three days. And once they see your approach to them, most of the time patients start to come around. Uh, and that goes with lying as well. And you just have to make certain assumptions as a clinician so, so you do not uh, jeopardize their well, uh, welfare. So I don't mean that a person comes in here and tells me, hey, I haven't used all week and somehow sneaks by and gives me a clean urine. And I say, okay, that's great. Here's 150 clonopins and 300 suboxins. That's not what I mean. If they come in here saying that, I will in a very professional and um, almost endearing way tell them, look, I'm not here to judge you. Be honest with me. I'm going to assume you've used and you're going to get a weak supply. What you'll start to see, and uh, in all of this, you have to also protect your license. This is a different world where the professional has autonomy. You have to be careful so no one calls you out. Why are you giving this guy medication? And what you need to do is take a strong note with medical justification and necessity. So when you bring him in every day, and at some point, you know, as you increase the intensity of care and demand on them, at some point, most people will revert back to their original self and get on with the program. If you behave and act like a watchdog, the police, uh, a ruling authoritarian body, uh, they will repel and run away. And my whole goal is to keep the patient engaged as best as I can. Uh, in our own case, as my practice is growing, uh, that's getting really difficult. Uh, and so future, as there's other people that will come in and I'll train, I'm going to have this as part of the training. There's one other thing that occurs, which is diversion. That issue you have to have minimal tolerance for simply because uh, you can get in a lot of trouble yourself as a, practice, a, practice, a practicing physician and it's your license they're really jeopardizing here. So my threshold for that is very, very low as is stealing prescriptions. But as far as lying and still using, I work with that as long as I can possibly tolerate it without it me without me interpreting that it's just simply malicious or they're jeopardizing my practice. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed those videos, go ahead and click above to my right for other related videos. And please, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and press the ring button. Uh, and please continue to watch as our uh, methamphetamine series is continuing at this time.